It's 43 degrees in Richland Center on this Wednesday afternoon, November 13th. Good afternoon. It is a cloudy 43 degrees in Richland Center at 12.09. For WRCO News, I'm Joanne Krulotz. Republican U.S. Senate candidate Eric Hovde will not be conceding the race a week after the election. Hovde claims there were voting irregularities in Milwaukee County and accuses Democrats of propping up third-party candidates to siphon votes from him. Preliminary results from last Tuesday show Hovde losing to Democrat incumbent Tammy Baldwin by just 29,000 votes inside the margin where he can request a recount. Republicans and Democrats in the state Senate and Assembly are looking ahead to the upcoming legislative session post-election. Rochester Republican Robin Voss was re-elected as Assembly Speaker, while Middleton Democrat Diane Hesselbein is back as Minority Leader in the state Senate. In the Assembly, Republican Scott Krug of Nakusa was elected as the new Assistant Majority Leader, while Walworth native Republican Tyler August is back as Majority Leader. Hesselbein says it's, look, he's looking forward to the upcoming legislative session and is proud of the work Democrats did in trimming the Republican majority in the Senate to 18 to 15. Wisconsin's legislative session starts January 6th. Richland County is currently working on a radio tower project. During this process, the county had a site in the Yuba area with a landowner that is no longer a viable site. The county has found an alternate site, but this will cause increased cost as Edge Consulting will have to perform the assessments and surveys for this new site. The costs have been reviewed by Mike Day, Project Consultant, and by Barbara Scott, Management Information System Director. There are funds available in the Radio Tower Project, funds for such contingencies. The added cost is $26,200. The Richland County Executive and Finance Committee approved the change at last night's meeting. The county requires a procurement policy and fee schedule to ensure responsible financial practices are consistent across all county departments and appropriate statutory guidance and financial best practices are followed. In so doing, the Richland County Executive and Finance Committee approved a policy and fee schedule. In other action, the Executive and Finance Committee approved to accept a donation from the Richland County Ambulance Association in the amount of $30,866 for the purpose of personal protective equipment for EMS staff. To accept a $3,000 grant from the Richland Campus Foundation to hire a part-time AmeriCorps employee to expand the 4-H program, a contract with the Lou Everett Group for countywide training at a cost of $26,650, and the Richland County Farm Land Lease Agreement for rental property in the county. The items approved by the Executive and Finance Committee will be forwarded to the full Board of Supervisors to be approved. The Richland Center City Council held a public hearing at last night's meeting. This public hearing was part of the process of working with the Wisconsin DOT Bureau of Aeronautics to identify projects and gain funding for the operation and capital improvement of the Richland Airport. Following the public hearing, the council approved petitioning the Secretary of Transportation for airport improvement aid for the airport. Proposed improvements include land acquisition, the procurement of snow removal equipment, reconfiguring, reconstructing, or rehabilitating taxiways, taxiway connectors, and associated lighting and signs, the apron runway 1735, and associated lighting to conduct an airport master plan exhibit, T hangar construction, construction of a maintenance building, and crack fill and seal coat runway 1735. The council also approved an agency agreement and federal block owner assurances, which is part of the process of working with the Wisconsin DOT Bureau of Aeronautics to identify projects, gain funding, and execute projects for the Richland Airport. The agreement authorizes the Secretary of Transportation to act as the city's agent in the matter of the airport development and offers an assurance by the city that it will adhere to the conditions of the grant funds. The Richland Center City Council also approved the division of a parcel of land on Covered Bridge Road, a community center meal site agreement with the county, and a number of arcade licenses. 
During Tuesday night's meeting, the Baraboo City Council discussed closing the city pool, cuts to the city's shared ride taxi service, as well as increased event permit fees and parking fines, among other cost-saving measures. Mayor Rob Nelson said the council will have to make some tough cost-cutting decisions in the coming weeks. They are all trying to do the best job that they can with limited resources. Nobody wants to impose cuts that are going to be hurtful to portions of our population. Everybody's trying to do what they can to maintain the vitality and the health of the Baraboo community. And, you know, it's not an easy job. Nelson said many of the economic challenges Baraboo is facing are structural and built into the state's funding formula for municipalities. Until the legislature gives us some additional tools in our toolbox to try to raise revenue and pay our bills, we're going to always be looking for ways we can cut things. Um, And so the items that we would be looking at for 2025 are um, basically the start because the picture doesn't really look any better in 2026 or beyond. And so then you're going to have to look at additional things to be cut. A majority of residents said no to a city operational referendum, which would have meant a $2 million tax levy increase to maintain the city's current services. Wisconsin health care providers say they've had to ration IV fluids due to damage caused by Hurricane Helene weeks ago. According to health officials, a number of hospitals used IV fluids that were manufactured in a North Carolina plant that suffered severe damage in the storm. Lyle Cradwell is the director of emergency preparedness program at the Richland Hospital. There's a, a big plant in um, Marion, North Carolina, and uh, Baxter Health owns that plant. And it's absolutely an enormous plant. So that plant in particular produces 1.5 million bags of IV solutions per day. And Baxter itself accounts for about 60% of the IV fluids produced in the United States. So when Hurricane Helene came through, the storm surge really affected that plant in particular. And we looked at images of the plant itself, and you can see just mud and debris, and there are loading docks underwater. They also have a river that runs by this particular plant, and there's one uh, bridge that was used to get trucks in and out of that site, and of course that bridge was washed out. So... You know, obviously, that's a huge shortage for the nation when we lose that kind of volume of IV solutions in short order. IV solutions are used for a number of reasons. Rehydration is, you know, one of those things that we can use that for. Sometimes we use these solutions to, you know, when we're giving antibiotics, we'll give uh, antibiotics with a little bit of fluid following that as well. Um, So those are some typical things that we'd use IV fluids for. Redwell says he believes every hospital across the country has been affected. Without reliable access to the IV fluids, hospitals have started to manage their supplies more closely and in some cases consider whether a patient really does need IV fluids. What we did when we heard of this impending shortage coming is we stood up what we call our hospital incident command structure. And really what that is, it's just a way to kind of communicate across the organization and start to deal with the situation at hand. So we brought a group of leaders together. So everything from physician leaders uh, throughout the different departments in the hospital, nurse directors, uh, our pharmacy director, Dave Kepler, was heavily involved. But we just started to talk about you know, what conservation measures we had to put in place. And so we use these conservation measures to kind of give us a little bit more time so that the plant could get back up and running again. So the other things that we had done, uh, we looked at, okay, uh, those conservation measures and how effective they were. So we wanted to be able to track our inventory and our usage of those IV fluids throughout the organization, too. So, you know, you probably heard in the news larger facilities, uh, some in Minneapolis, for example, started to cancel what they call elective procedures. And we were able to kind of get away without doing that. We made some modifications uh, in our surgery department to just lessen the amount of fluid that we're giving to folks. You know, we also talked a lot about patients that could take oral intake, so they could drink by themselves to use oral hydration as kind of a primary method instead of IV hydration. 
So far, hospital systems have managed to keep up with patient needs with less supply, and patients have not been adversely affected. We did start notifying patients in our surgery department when they were being scheduled for surgery that, you know, this is a possibility and we could uh, reschedule their surgical procedure if, you know, this shortage persists. And to date, we haven't had to do any of that. But no, I don't know that patients themselves have really noticed that impact at this point. According to Cradwell, Baxter is working to get back up and running as soon as possible. We have been following along with Baxter when they push out press releases. And so there's been a lot of resources that have been dedicated to that site and getting that site back up and operating. And I think that they're ahead of schedule. Uh, They continue to tell us that by the end of the year, they anticipate being back to 100% production. But um, that timeline's still a little murky. The Richland Hospital will continue to be cautious in its usage of IV solutions at this time. We need to continue to be conservative. We need to continue to have our conservation measures in place. But we don't uh, anticipate, you know, canceling elective procedures at this point. We don't uh, anticipate any impact to our patients at this point. I think over the last month here or so, we've noticed that our inventory has grown a little bit and we've seen a decrease in our usage in patient care areas. Lyle Cradwell said the Richland Hospital is always planning ahead to mitigate situations that may arise. Computer users enjoy the convenience of going online to help make tasks such as shopping or paying a bill easier and less consuming. Owners of websites that are accessed for those tasks can track the activity of an individual does on their site. Michelle Reinen is with the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. There are legitimate companies that track your online activity for several reasons. Some of those are to save your preferences and information, like usernames and passwords, addresses, and items you leave in your shopping cart so they can send that reminder, don't forget to buy me. But then there could be a way to show you your personalized content, like local weather, stories about topics you're interested in, and advertisements. And another legitimate reason is to gather data about how people use their website apps, like pages they visit, how long they spend on it, and types of devices they're using. And that goes to researching and knowing about their customers. Precautions should be taken in case you are being tracked so your information is not accessed by scammers. There's several forms of online tracking that aren't as wonderful as others because if that data falls into the wrong hands, like a scammer, they just have so much information about you. And so one of those is the cookies, those small pieces of data that attach to your web browser and can be accessed by websites you visit. And another is device fingerprinting, which uses your browser's unique configurations and settings to track your activity. And apps on your computer or phone often have their own tracking systems as well. But you can control some of that by clearing your cookies and looking at the security and privacy settings on your device so you aren't tracked and that data isn't being collected. But you have to counterbalance and weigh the unique features and conveniences that you are trading off for not being tracked, but at the same time, your data isn't being collected and stored by other companies and potentially scammers. Michelle Reinen suggests what to do with cookies on your computer and mobile device. You need to decide what cookie setting you want to have on your devices because how much data do you want a site that you're just browsing by versus one you're going to regularly and you maybe want them to remember something for your convenience versus a one-stop looky-loo at a site type situation. So really determine and control what you are handing over. If you have concerns about website tracking your activity or have had information stolen because of tracking, you can contact ADCAP's Consumer Protection Hotline by phone at 1-800-422-7128 or by email at datcphotline at wi.gov. 62 units of blood were collected at the Muscaday Community Blood Drive yesterday, including 11 double red cell donations. Registration volunteers were Jackie Schmadick, Asher Frazier, and Kate Frazier. Charlene Janice, Marsha, Sandra, and Asher served refreshments and provided homemade baked goods. The next Muscaday Community Blood Drive is Tuesday, January 14th from 1130 to 530. 
The American Red Cross is highlighting the ongoing need for blood and platelet donors as festive schedules ramp up this fall. Eligible individuals, especially those with typo blood and those giving platelets, are encouraged to make a donation just ahead of the holiday season. Blood supply momentum must remain steady as the Red Cross has worked this month to recover blood products uncollected due to recent hurricanes. Any disruption in the ability to collect blood can lead to an impact on routine and life-saving medical care. Two blood drives are being held today. One is at the Dodgeville High School until 4 this afternoon. The second is in Richland Center at the Richland Center Community Center until 5.30. The seasons may change, but the need for blood donors stays the same. Give blood or platelets and make a big difference in someone's life by visiting redcrossblood.org, calling 1-800-RED-CROSS, or by using the Red Cross Blood Donor app. Today's winner in the Ithaca Football Boosters Calendar Raffle is Jesse Stellner.